Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Steinberg. Joining me here in the studio is John Hofel. Welcome to this week's edition of the LaRouche Political Action Committee Weekly Report. Today is Wednesday, September 9th, 2009. Uh, John, Washington and capitals around the world are obviously still reeling from the impact of Lyndon LaRouche's uh, very powerful international webcast that took place just about 24 hours ago on uh, Tuesday, September 8th. And um, I guess now the big question in the air in Washington is, uh, will President Obama shave off his Hitler mustache and accept the offer that has been generously presented by Lyndon LaRouche before a uh, very large international audience in yesterday's webcast? Yeah, I mean, the, he's got a, his presidency is breaking apart because of his insistence on going along with this British imperial bailout policy and austerity policy. And it's destroying his presidency and now they have to make a choice, but the only way they can go that can, the only solution in sight is to go with Mr. LaRouche's program. So, yes, they have, he has to shave off his Hitler mustache. He has to give up his policies and adopt an American system policy. Otherwise, his administration will be destroyed. Well, the, uh, we're also just hours away from the president's uh, delivering of a uh, message on health care policy between, uh, before a joint session of Congress. And there's two aspects of this. Number one, uh, the fact that it is completely unprecedented for a president to order a joint session of Congress to be convened, especially when it's simply because there is a uh, tough piece of legislation being fought through. Uh, this idea that the president can snap his fingers and call a joint session of Congress uh, is really yet one more major example of this president's adopting of the exact same unitary executive idea that we saw with Dick Cheney and his uh, puppet George W. Bush for the previous eight years, especially immediately following the attacks of September 11th, 2001. Uh, John, what are you hearing about this reaction against the president going with full bore this unitary executive form of uh, presidential dictatorship? Well, you know, on the financial beat, you're not hearing a whole lot about this stuff. But politically, I mean, you have, uh, you have an uproar in certain circles because people see that what Obama is trying to pull is more dictatorial powers. That the whole idea is, you know, he's acting like he thinks he's king. And that doesn't sit well with the American people, as the recent town meetings have made clear. And Congress is very nervous about this. You know, so they're going to face, they have a dilemma. Either they stand up to this clown and assert the authority that, of the Constitution of the United States and actually act like representatives of the people, or they're basically all going to be tossed aside, too. Um, I want to, first of all, make sure that uh, everyone out there who has not yet uh, had a chance to see the LaRouche webcast in its entirety, uh, please do it. And it's actually desirable to uh, actually watch the video uh, posted here on this LaRouche Pack website uh, rather than just simply read the transcript. There was a dynamic in the room, the uh, kind of back and forth on many of the questions that came up during the lengthy Q&A period uh, really have to be seen to fully grasp the importance of what Lyndon LaRouche did yesterday. And I think, John, one of the things that uh, struck me uh, about LaRouche's presentation is that on the one hand, he really set a kind of a tension uh, in his opening remarks. On the one hand, he was ruthlessly frank about the fact that the President of the United States, Barack Obama, is thoroughly unqualified for the job. In fact, uh, the British and allied Wall Street interests that did everything possible to ensure that he was the Democratic nominee and then elected president uh, chose him 
precisely because he was completely unqualified to deal with the crisis at hand. So LaRouche meant no words and uh, spoke in very blunt, and I wouldn't call them unkind terms. In fact, I'd call them very kind terms uh, because he really told it like it is. The president is in deep trouble because he's got no executive experience. He does not know how to think about policy issues. He doesn't understand the dynamics of politics. He's been blindsided because he knows nothing about the economy whatsoever, uh, as is evidenced by the fact that he listens to Larry Summers, Peter Orzak, Tim Geithner, and a bunch of behavioral economists who are all certifiably insane. Uh, but nevertheless, LaRouche also made clear, we want this presidency to succeed. We want President Obama to turn this thing around immediately, to fire these advisors, to bring in a competent team of advisors who are prepared to listen to the policy solutions of Lyndon LaRouche. And as LaRouche said, stick with me, kid, and we'll make you a great president. You can leave office after four or eight years, and people will look back on you as the president who oversaw the turnaround of the worst economic and financial collapse in modern history. Uh, is that a fairly good summary of uh, Mr. LaRouche's approach to... Yeah, yeah. He, he told the truth, and he was, you know, he put it on the line. Yeah. I mean, this guy is, you know... If Obama wants to succeed, he's got to go with LaRouche. Right. We'll save him because we want the country to survive. We want the world to survive. Right. It's not really about Obama. Now, one of the other issues that, uh, that Mr. LaRouche took up uh, right up front, uh, and I, I was in the audience and I was even a little stunned at the forcefulness with which he made this point. He said, we are closer today to dictatorship in this country than we even were at any point during the entire eight years of uh, Bush and Cheney and that the president has reverted to all of the uh, unprecedented dictatorial powers that Cheney asserted and is now using them, including signing statements, uh, this incident tonight with the convening of Congress in a joint session, uh, is a really the height of arrogance and a sign of real disrespect for the actual separation of powers. If the president wanted the Congress to hear what he has to say on health care, then um, he could have invited the leadership of Congress, both parties, both houses, whatever combinations he wants, to come over to the White House and sit down and have a private discussion. Uh, and, you know, the other aspect of this is that if the president thinks that by pulling this publicity stunt that he's going to somehow energize popular support, um, then he's really got another thing coming. I mean, you mentioned a moment ago the uh, mass strike ferment reflected in the town hall meetings. LaRouche at the webcast yesterday said that 60% of the American people have come to uh, hate what President Obama represents. And so uh, what do you think the results are going to be tonight if he delivers some kind of speech on health care that doesn't reflect a total absolute retreat from the fascist policies that he was promoting. Well, I think he'd better back off of it if he wants to survive politically. And it's also going to be interesting to see what the reactions of the various congressmen are, because normally, you know, they, they sit there and they all applaud like a bunch of parrots or something. But uh, this time, if we, you know, if they want to survive themselves, they've got to start distancing themselves from these policies. Right. So it's sort of a gut check for Congress. I mean, and, and another thing which is sort of, I guess, related in this is, you know, the out of touch way this administration is so out of touch about what's going on in the real economy and the real country that Michelle Obama wants to close down one of the busy streets in Washington, D.C. to put up some sort of a fruit farm, <laughs> you know, a farmer's market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is so you have people who already, you know, Washington, D.C. traffic is horrible. Right. But they don't really care. You mm -hmm. know, they want to push their green agenda, so we're going to just shut down a major road, and we're going to put up a farmer's market. Jeez. You know, it's just nuts. Well, uh, the disconnect from the reality of what the majority of Americans are experience, uh, experiencing, this is, uh, this is a fundamental issue that, again, Mr. LaRouche addressed quite 
forcefully and repeatedly during the webcast yesterday, partly because it was a major theme of his opening remarks and partly because quite a number of questions that came in from leading economists, including some people who are actually part of the economic advisory team to the president, uh, came in with follow-up questions. So uh, one of the big issues is uh, unemployment. And what LaRouche said is that the first responsibility of a president ought to be to make sure that there are adequate jobs for the American people. That if you don't launch a policy that creates literally, in this case, millions of new jobs, productive jobs, within the real economy, uh, that uh, we are going to see a social explosion very soon that makes the events of August look so tame by comparison that it's hard to predict where this is headed. So what is the job situation in the United States? The, the unemployment figure is 9.7 percent? Yeah. I th My personal view on the unemployment figures is that they are a total fraud that you can't even take them and say, if you move things around from one column to another, you get anything true. They're just lying, mm -hmm. I think. Because, and I think that's increasingly the case with all government statistics, because they're right. trying everything they can do to hide the damage that's been done by these policies. And so you probably have actual, un real unemployment in this country is probably around 30%, a right. third or so. Right. right, That there are all sorts of people who don't get counted for various reasons, because they're not actively looking for a job, there are no jobs in their areas, they're working some sort of trivial job while they're trying to hold things together and find a real job. So the real picture is far worse, and it tends to be worse in certain areas of the country that are just absolutely devastated, and then some areas do a little bit better. But the overall picture is that the jobs in the United States, they're, we're shutting down the economy, that people get laid off, People get uh, fired. Uh, <clears throat> companies collapse. You know that if you if you get out of school and you're looking for a job, you know you're not going to get the job you were trained for, or any job at all. Or any job days. at all that you see repeatedly across the country, where there'll be an applic job applicants, you know, ten or twenty job applicants for any particular job. Right. That you know, and the whole country is breaking apart. And if you add that to the fact that because of the death of the financial system, the credit machine has been cut off, and so people can't borrow money to get through rough periods, then basically when you lose your job at this point, you know, unless you have family or friends you can go live with, you're in real trouble. And everybody's living on the edge. Everybody is, you know, most people are in debt up to the hilt. And anything that goes wrong is enough to just throw you right over the edge. Well, you know, one of the things that came out in one of the questions, it was a very long, uh, very detailed, almost a kind of a mini dissertation on unemployment statistics. The one thing that I, I found striking is that between now and the end of the year, um, 1.3 million people currently receiving uh, unemployment insurance uh, will run out, and the vast, perhaps overwhelming majority of them are not going to find jobs between now and when that money runs out. So you're going to see a whole segment of formerly employed workers who've now burned through anywhere from 39 to 42 weeks, maybe even a full year of unemployment, have not found a job, are going to run out of unemployment mm -hmm. insurance, and they are going to be on the scrap heap. They're going to literally, in many cases, be homeless, foodless, jobless. And that is a social situation that no president in his right mind can allow to, to lock in without taking drastic measures to do something about it. Yeah, now, absolutely. I mean, you have, if you look in, in terms of municipal elections, like mayors, you know, so many mayors, they get, they lose their office because they can't pick up the trash or right. they can't plow, plow the snow. You know, that the kind of things that everybody has to live in are the mm -hmm. things that become real. And so when people lose their jobs, they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. They don't know where their future is going to, what's going to happen to them in the future. And when some politician gets up and talks about, don't worry, things are going to get better. We've got these plans just around the corner of the recovery. Right. And people say, I'm not going to make it that long. Exactly. What are you going to do? Quit, quit talking and do something. And that's the problem they've got. You know, that I thought one of the most uh, dramatic moments 
yesterday in the, uh, in the webcast uh, came in response to a question, uh, again, a fairly long, elaborate question from an economist working with the National Governors uh, Association. And uh, he presented a proposal and actually asked for Mr. LaRouche's endorsement on the proposal, uh, which involved using certain revenue-sharing procedures to help bail out the states. Forty-nine states out of 50 are bankrupt, hopelessly bankrupt. They burned through their entire next fiscal year budget in the first few months because they came in with so much of a debt overhang. And so the proposal was that the federal government send out revenue sharing checks to each of the 50 states to help them through the crisis. And uh, I was really struck at how violently uh, Mr. LaRouche responded and said, absolutely not. He said, the issue is the presidency. If we don't force a change in the presidency, then we're doomed, we're finished. The country and the world's not going to make it through to the end of the year without collapsing into a dark age. And so he said, stop looking for palliatives, stop looking for patchwork solutions to a situation that's gone so far over the edge that unless we solve it top down right now, uh, there's no future. Yeah, we're out of time. We're out of time. The, the problem is that the government, federal government is bankrupt, that it's going to have increasing difficulty in borrowing the money that it needs to survive because the world economy is shutting down. I mean, they can play all the financial games they want in Washington, but the global economy is shutting down. The physical economy, which underlies all of their pretensions and their games, is collapsing. And, and all of their house of cards is going to fall. And it makes no difference what kind of tweaks they give to the system or how, what kind of accounting frauds they use, what kind of games they play. It doesn't really matter because the foundation of all of it is crumbling right out from under them. And it's all going to go. And when it goes, there's not going to be anything to keep people alive. The, 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 <clears throat> required, the necessities of life are going to start disappearing and you're going to have real chaos. And so we have to bite the bullet. We have to deal with the problem. We have to solve it. We have to make the president of the United States act like the president of the United States. We have to change policies. Despite himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to return to the Constitution that most people in Washington, and certainly the leaderships in Washington, are absolutely opposed to that process. They don't want to do it. They don't want a Constitution. They like the system that they've set up, which made it all rich. But it's got to go. We've got to have a change. And it's got to be focused around straightening out the president as a way of straightening out the policies of the country. Uh, LaRouche said explicitly, um, number one, end globalization, uh, which is tantamount to empire, which is tantamount to a global private central banker's monetary dictatorship, uh, which means writing off uh, the vast majority, tens of trillions of dollars in debt within the system that's completely illegitimate debt. Just write it off the books and start from a, a fresh slate by going back to a credit system and then spreading that credit system by treaty agreement uh, around the world. Um, now, um, John, we were talking earlier. Um, we're coming up to the, uh, I guess, mid-September, maybe September 23rd, 24th, the next G20 heads of state meeting in Pittsburgh. And uh, in preparation for that, the uh, finance ministers and central bank heads from the G20 countries met in London over this past weekend. Uh, you took a look at some of the documents both going into and coming out of that meeting. There was a 14-page memo by Geithner, and then there were various statements. So. Uh, to give us the real story on what, what that's all about and what to expect from Pittsburgh. Well, it was a, the, the, <clears throat> the meeting in London was a clown show. And you could only make fun of it. I mean, the, the, the big thing that they were pushing was the idea that it's time to begin talking about winding down all the bailout procedures. Not ending them, of course, because mm -hmm. we need that money. We've got to keep it going. But we're going to start talking about the possibility of ending it. 
you know, the recovery is taking hold, and so therefore this becomes the environment in which we need to begin winding things down. You know, and, but, but we're not doing it now. No way. Yeah. Keep that money coming. Yeah. We need it. All right. Geithner had this proposal to increase capital standards. All right. Now, you know, you just have to laugh out loud. I mean, the banks are bankrupt. They don't meet the capital standards we have, and we're keeping them open. All right. So raising the capital standards is a meaningless act. It looks good in the press releases. You can say we're, we're doing something. But it's a joke. It's an absolute joke. Now, another thing that they're doing is they're saying that we want the smaller countries to feel like they have more say in monetary reform and in regulations and things. Now, this is another joke. I mean, the empire doesn't want the big nations having any say. Right. <laughs> you know, the United States doesn't really have any say <clears throat> in these things because what the, the United States policy is controlled through London, through this, through the empire. So all they're really doing is they're saying they're setting a trap. They're saying, OK, all of you guys, if you come join us with this IMF operation, you know, we'll set up new standards and we'll protect you against the United States and we'll we'll make this whole thing work. And it's a giant trap because what that's that this IMF operation is one of the ways in which they're going to establish this global financial dictatorship. So this whole thing was public relations froth and underneath it pure fascism. And that's what we're going to get at the G20 meeting, the full meeting in Pittsburgh later this month. This is exactly why LaRouche put so much emphasis on the presidency. Because unless you get a break from Washington, D.C., unless you get the presidency back on track with an American system, credit system orientation, which starts from the premise that all of this debt is illegal, and that the busiest part of our federal government ought to be the Department of Justice processing so many bankers into custody on their way to very long jail sentences for, th for theft. Unless we win that fight on the U.S. side, then we're plunging into a dark age, and it's going to start before the end of this year. Maybe it's going to start in terms of a uh, massive and far worse than hoped for uh, pandemic of the swine flu. Maybe we're going to see something looking remarkably like what Europe looked like in the 14th century. Um, one of the things that came up, again, in the Q&A uh, session yesterday, uh, some confusion from people who really don't understand what Mr. LaRouche is talking about when he talks about monetary hyperinflation at the same time that you've got a physical collapse of production and you also have a collapse of financial aggregates. In other words, you've got the printing presses at the Fed and every other central bank around the world on steroids working overtime. At the very same time that things like the real estate bubble, uh, stock values, uh, mortgage portfolios are crashing. And you've got a continuing collapse of physical production. You don't have to be at the point where a loaf of bread costs $400 to be faced with monetary hyperinflation. It's the hyperinflation that's going into the bailout of this gigantic unpayable bubble. And uh, that's going to give at some point full bore. But right now, we're already in a situation where if you just look at the massive increase in unemployment, and the bankruptcy of almost all 50 states. Um, how is that not worse than a full-scale global Great Depression? Really a, clo a total systemic collapse of everything. We're already there. It doesn't require another shoe dropping because it's already dropped. And that's, I think that was what was the trigger of the events of... Uh, of August with, the, with these congressional town hall meetings turning into riots. Um, one of the other things that I just want to close on is that um, an aspect of the illegal debt, the debt that LaRouche says should all be totally canceled and the bailout money called back in, um, the first glimmer of this mass strike process was actually what we saw during 2007 into early 2008 around massive outpourings of support for LaRouche's Homeowners and Bank Protection Act. 
And uh, had that legislation not been killed off by the likes of Nancy Pelosi, Barney Frank, Chris Dodd, and others in the Congress, um, we would have been out of this mess. We would not have spent $23, $24 trillion bailing out a great big black hole of debt that can never be paid. Mm -hmm. So um, what, again, just to kind of walk people through it, what is the essence of LaRouche's solution? What was the essence of the HBPA? And what, what does he mean when he says, go back to Glass-Steagall standards? Well, you're going to, we have a financial system which has become a giant casino that it bears most of the financial transactions have no relationship whatsoever to any activity in the real economy. And yet they create enormous financial claims that are supposed to be satisfied by the production of the real economy. Right. So the first thing you do is you just say, no, uh-uh. No, if it's not real, we're not covering it. That you freeze this stuff and you put this thing, you, you, free, you write off all the derivatives. They no longer exist. You take all of this funny money debt that was created through the financial markets that bears no relationship to anything real, and you freeze it with the idea of, of writing off most of it. Right? You have to, we have to deal with globalization. Globalization is a mechanism of empire, and it has been used to make every nation dependent upon the empire and its cartels for necessities of life. So we have to end that. You know, so you do that by going back to a sovereign credit system in which you bankrupt the empire. You put it out of business. If you want to, you guys can live on our planet, but you're going to have to behave. You don't run the show anymore. You know, and basically that's the way you have to do it. So there are policies. You have the credit system. You have a four powers agreement. You have, a, you know, an alliance of nations which will enforce this policy. And then we go back to science-driven rebuilding of the productive base of our economy. And that's the way out typified by the, the plan to put, uh, to industrialize the moon and Mars. That uh, that's where we have to go. That this idea that we're going to keep servicing this cannibal, which is eating us alive, this parasite, and that that's going to somehow solve anything, you know, we see it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And sooner or later, we're going to have to give this thing a flea dip, and we're going to have to start re taking care of actual people instead of all these financial players, and start rebuilding our economy. Yeah. Well, again, the issue comes down to President Obama and the presidency. Uh, no matter how many times a day he shaves, that Hitler mustache keeps coming back instantaneously. And it's not going to go away until he makes the decision that he's gone off in the wrong direction, uh, he's followed the wrong policies, He's hired the wrong advisors. Uh, he's kissed the rump of the wrong queen. And that he's going to have to essentially put himself at the hands and at the disposal of others. There's many, many people who uh, could be brought in to fill vital slots as long as they follow the agenda that's been set out by Mr. LaRouche. Yesterday at the webcast, several days earlier in the form of a comprehensive, really book-length, treatise on political economy. Uh, this is something that is very challenging, but again, is a must read. Uh, LaRouche put uh, an enormous effort into spelling out an entirely new revolutionary approach to political economy. Not some hypothetical, theoretical idea that we can maybe get to sometime in the future, but a series of steps to be taken immediately based on the most profound foundational understanding of what the real scientific principles of political economy are all about. So Mr. President, to repeat Mr. LaRouche's words from his webcast yesterday, uh, take his offer. Take the opportunity to change policy direction, to submit yourself to a whole different set of advisors who are prepared to implement the policies that will create tens of millions of jobs, rebuild the nation's infrastructure, restructure a bankrupt, hopelessly bankrupt bank banking system, put the country back on a sound credit policy footing, and extend those arrangements internationally 
through a treaty agreement that starts with the four powers, the United States, Russia, China, and India. If you do those things, Mr. President, you will retire from office as a hero, as perhaps the president who did more to turn around the economy than anyone since Franklin Roosevelt. So the opportunity is there, the choice is yours, and we can only say that time is running out to accept the last best opportunity to save the country and the world from misery beyond what I think anybody practically can imagine. And we're not talking five years, ten years from now. We're talking before the end of this year. So, John, on that note, uh, I think uh, we're going to call it quits for today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, today is Wednesday, September 9th, 2009. Hope you'll join us next week for the next edition of the LaRouche Political Action Committee Weekly Report. In the meantime, study the LaRouche webcast. Do yourself a favor. Watch it from beginning to end. If you can do it in one sitting, great. If not, do it over the course of several days. But you owe it to yourself to hear what LaRouche has to say in his own words, in his own voice. And if you haven't already done so, then take the opportunity right after that to join the LaRouche Political Action Committee to make the biggest contribution that you can make because the efforts of LPAC are all that stands between you and the abyss. So we'll see you next week, and thanks again for joining us.